Today, the Southern Highland Craft Guild makes its home along the beautiful Blue Ridge Parkway in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. Basically what it is, it's to serve the, the people who are going down the Blue Ridge Parkway and want to get a taste of what, it's, what local craftsmanship is like or regional craftsmanship is like. The Guild promotes the development of American crafts through a variety of programs, including workshops featuring local artists. Visitors can watch artists practice their craft and learn of the techniques they use. Laying it down. The other hand just helps move the string and hold it in place. Right now we're very interested in transforming brooms into functional art. So therefore we're out looking for the more unusual pieces of wood rather than just the straight sticks. But of course, that's the way it's been over the centuries. Each craft, as more and more people devoted themselves to it, gradually turned into an art. This technique originated in Turkey over 500 years ago, and throughout its history, it's been a very carefully guarded secret. Originally, they used their marbling to mark their state documents, and they didn't want to have any forgeries, so they just kept the process a secret. But since all secrets aren't meant to be kept, marbling moved from Turkey over into Western Europe about the time that the printing press was invented. And that's when bookbinders started marbling, and they used their marble papers usually inside their leather-bound books as decorative end papers. Now these little blobs of color you see me throwing down are called stones, so this is a stone pattern. And I can print this the way that it is, but I'd like to show you how I can move the paint to create other designs. You can see while the paints are floating how flexible they are. Essentially, I'm lining the paints up into stripes, and then when I take this comb and comb through the stripes, I'll get a more delicate pattern. Now, if I pick up the comb and I move it over a half space and come back in the opposite direction, I'll get a pattern called chevron. And once I've done the fine combing, then I switch to a tool that has a larger space between the teeth, and I'll use this for the finishing touches. Now the paper I'm using I've treated with aluminum sulfate and that makes the paints permanently bond to the paper. And in our studio this is what we call instant gratification. You get your results right away. The survival of the arts and crafts movement during the depression was due in part to the vision of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. One of Roosevelt's most significant New Deal programs, the Works Progress Administration, or WPA, was a massive employment relief program launched in the spring of 1935. WPA projects across the country employed thousands of artists who produced more than 2,500 murals in hospitals, schools, and other public places, nearly 108,000 paintings, and some 18,000 pieces of sculpture. In 1935, one of America's most influential artists, Frank Lloyd Wright, ignited his career by designing the Kaufman House in western Pennsylvania. Popularly known as Falling Water, the house reflected a truly American style. In early December 1941, Japanese warplanes attacked Pearl Harbor. Immediately, America's focus shifted completely to fighting a global war. The country mobilized, and a system of mechanized mass production was unleashed. Soon, the world marveled at the amount of production coming from the United States. The war would impact each American in their own way. 
George Nakashima and his wife, both American-born Japanese descendants, had just opened a furniture workshop in Seattle when the U.S. entered World War II. Like other Japanese Americans, they were sent to an internment camp. But it was here, in the Idaho desert, that Nakashima learned his craft from a Japanese carpenter. After his release, Nakashima was allowed to settle on a farm in New Hope, Pennsylvania. There he set up a small studio in his garage and began a remarkable career. Nakashima works are represented in the most important permanent collections in the world, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and the National Museum of Modern Art in Tokyo. Though he started his shop as a one-man operation, Nakashima would go on to employ some of the world's finest craftsmen. After 40 years of service, these artisans remain devoted to the man and his ideas and are still working at the Nakashima studio today, which is now operated by his daughter. As World War II ended in 1945, the nation's industrial production shifted to the civilian market. Artists were forced to combat the onslaught of a new system of mass production. This struggle continued throughout the 1950s as modern homes with modern appliances dominated the American mindset. Not until the decade of the 1960s would the arts and crafts movement renew itself with vigor. Vermont artist Janet Zug spends her working days learning about the properties and possibilities involved in working with glass. So the glass coming out of the oven, is out of the furnace that is, is like 2130 degrees. And if I were to just come out there and blow it, it would just fall right on the floor. So it's just too hot. I have to cool it down. Um, so that's what I'm doing here. It's called blocking. I'm pulling it and shaping it all at the same time, trying to get it even, evenly heated. Janet began as an apprentice in a glass blowing studio in Vermont. For the past 10 years, she has run her own glass blowing business, which is her sole source of income. That's kind of a fun move, it's crackling, and you just dip the hot glass in the water and then heat it again. We go back to the bench and shape it and put a little bubble into it. This thing is the glory hall, it's where we reheat it. Constantly trying to keep it within that working temperature. Working with glass has been a rewarding experience for Janet, both creatively and financially. Definitely you can make a living. I've been doing it for, I've been making my living at this for 10 years now. Um, and, you know, some years were kind of rough. But truthfully, it's really not anymore. <laughs> it's going pretty good. <laughs> Janet is part of a talented new generation of artisans who are benefiting from a revival of interest in American arts and crafts. But for the artists who preceded Janet, talent alone could not ensure success. After a decade marred by World War II, Americans looked forward to the 1950s. The decade would change the nation's cultural and physical landscape. Industrialization spurred growth and consumerism, but arts and crafts were passed over in favor of a quick, uniform, and mass-produced aesthetic.